song, I found a love greater than life itself. I, I want you to think about that phrase. I mean, can you, because I know you all love this relationship with Jesus Christ, and I know you're here because you enjoy this knowledge of God and the salvation he brings, but, you know, think about those words. I, I, I found a love that's greater than life itself. Like, like God's love is this treasure that is so great that everything else pales in comparison. And I hope you're, you're not here because you're hoping that this Jesus will get you something. You know, it's more this Jesus that you found makes everything else seem pretty obsolete. It's this love that's better than anything else you can find in this life. And I, and I hope you really believe that. I hope you mean that as we sing that song and we think it through. Um, before I get into my message, there's a few things I want to clarify from uh, previous messages. I seem to do this like every two or three weeks, right? Kind of apologize for uh, the last two weeks. Um, but uh, let me just clarify a couple of things that I said. Um, a couple weeks ago, I, I read an email from a 65-year-old woman, and I referred to her as elderly. And I got a lot of emails after that saying 65 is not elderly anymore because now life expectancy is older and so 65 is considered middle age still. <laughs> if you want to believe that, that's great. <laughs> and uh, I'll go with it because that makes me an adolescent again and uh, we'll, we'll head with that. Um, on another note, <laughs> That, was, that wasn't a real good apology, was it? Um, on another note, um, on a more serious note, last week I gave a message, it was pretty heavy, and uh, some people had, a, had issue with it and questioned some of the things that I said, and I, I, I want to I wanna clarify some things, and I know that some of the things I said last week were unfamiliar, but that does not make it unbiblical. Okay, just because you're not used to hearing it a certain way and people don't normally say it like that, it doesn't make it unbiblical. In fact, as I look back at my notes and look at all the passages, I go, you know what, that was absolutely biblical. In fact, and this, this, this whole idea of when someone is in that type of gross sin, you know, and calling themselves a Christian, that do we have the right to ask them not to come? Well, 1 Corinthians 5, and remember the passage is out of 1 Corinthians 6 that we taught. If you turn back to 1 Corinthians 5 and how he closes the chapter, in 1 Corinthians 5, I'm going to put it on the screen starting in verse 11, Paul says this, now I'm writing to you that you must, must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or a slanderer, a drunkard or a swindler. With such a man do not even eat. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked man from among you. Okay, now that's not a passage you hear taught very often. It's not a passage that believers bring up, and for that reason, sometimes we have things backwards. I mean, it says at the end there, he says, you know, what business of, it, of mine is to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? And I believe Christians have this backwards all over the place, where we judge those outside, in the, outside of this room. We judge the world, and that is so wrong. The Bible tells us not to do that. I mean, I hear Christians all the time going, oh, those evil unbelievers, those pagans. And it's like, you know what? Leave them alone. What the Bible says is what we ought to be doing is looking, looking inside this room and judging one another. Those of us who call, call ourselves believers, he says, you know, if there are people who are in this room and they call themselves believers, but they're living that type of immoral lifestyle or that greedy lifestyle or that, that wicked, like, deceiving, what? he says, you know what? Don't even eat with those people. In fact, he says, expel the wicked man from among you. So if anything, last week, uh, maybe I was too gentle, if anything, with this issue because the Bible makes us a command and it says to expel the wicked man from among you. So I guess what I'm saying is I don't take back anything that I said last week. In fact, I put an exclamation point on it and say, you know what, that, that, it's very biblical. But, and be careful because we hear so many messages in the world and every once in a while you hear something that's so unique, but it's clearly in Scripture. Don't throw it out of your mind or say that it's wrong just because it doesn't feel like what you normally hear. Check it out. Study the Word of God. And if you disagree with something, then point it out in Scripture. 
but so often we can just think that something's wrong because we haven't heard it that way before, and yet it's so clearly biblical. Does that make sense? Okay. And then, uh, thank you, Tom. <laughs> um, it, uh, let, let me go to another topic. We're just kind of jumping from thing to thing. Uh, the land over on Tierra Rajada, um, just to make sure you understand where we're at with that, we turned in a completed application about, uh, well, we did it a year ago, and then they asked for more things. We, we've gone back and forth, and then we gave the, the final copy about uh, three months ago. And uh, once we turn in the application, the county has 30 working days to respond Um, After those 30 days were over, they asked if they could have an extension because they weren't done yet. So we gave them a 30-day extension. I mean, you really can't say no, but, you know, what are you going to say? So uh, we gave them another 30-day extension because that's what they asked for. So we gave them another 30 working days. After those 30 working days were over, they asked for another extension of uh, another 15 days. And so that was just this week. They asked for another extension. That's why we still don't know about the property. And so it's, it's a good sign, actually, that, uh, that they're still asking for things and they're still uh, looking into it. Um, we kind of have a rough idea of what they're going to ask, which is a little bit more information, which is, again, a positive thing, but it's not a yes or no still. So that's where we stand on that. Last week, I also told you that... Um, we had a problem with the loan that we were going to get. If you remember, last week was a date we were supposed to close escrow, but uh, luck, no, I shouldn't say luckily, in God's providence, um, the seller actually moved it back a month, which was great because the lender threw in a contingency that we couldn't meet. Um, and so we were kind of in trouble last week, so good thing it didn't close. But the contingency was they said you need to have more elders um, leading the church, you need to have more. You need to have more unpaid elders than paid ones. Okay, so we have these leaders of the church, and certain ones are pastors on staff, and then others are, are volunteer elders. And a couple of them were lay elders, were volunteer elders, and then we thought, you know, what, we could really use them on staff, and so we hired them. So now there are more that are paid than unpaid, and they gave us this contingency on the last week, saying you got to have more that are unpaid, and we'll give you a year to accomplish that. And we thought, well, that's, that's difficult because that means we have to get three more elders, and if any of them we want on staff, we can't do that. Um, so it, it just kind of put a weird uh, limitation on our leadership. And so we, we, as elders, we talked about it briefly as far as, well, there's a lot of things we can do to get around this um, that, that are pretty obvious. We could, we could take a couple of the paid elders and say, well, we'll make you junior elders and, uh, you know, and, and take you off the board, but you can still do everything. We could, uh, we could um, bring a couple of people on and go through this year process that they've asked us to, but uh, knowing that we could pay off the loan within a year, and so then we don't even have to deal with it by the time the year comes to an end. And, I, and, and all these things, we said, you know, there's so many ways around this, and none of them are technically lying, but there's just deception. It's just, it's deceptive. And there's even, even a hint of it. And all the elders just clearly agreed, you know, we're not going to go down that road. We'll need to find someone else to, to get a loan from. The problem is, is who's going to give you a $5 million loan in three weeks? Um, that's not real easy. And so we, we're, we're shopping around, looking at different things and just doing our due diligence. Um, and we ask that credit union and say, man, there's no way around this. No, no way around it. And I wrote them a letter, and I explained to them our situation. I just emailed them and said, look, here's the deal, is we've been trying so hard for 14 years to show integrity financially with leadership, being up front with everything. If we do this, we can get around your contingency, but it's a lack of integrity on our part to do so. Um, And I just simply asked, is there a way we can finish, you know, complete this loan and us both maintain our integrity? And they kind of shot it up the ladder. And I guess one of the top guys started doing some research on Cornerstone and uh, ended up writing a letter down to the little people and uh, telling them that, you know, I've, I've researched Cornerstone and their church. They talked about what we were involved in. He found out that, you know, what we gave to Children's Hunger Fund, World Impact, and around the world. He looked at our giving statements throughout the years. And he told them, you know what, these are the types of people we want to partner with. Make it happen. 
And so, uh, yeah, it was very cool. Yeah. <laughs> but it was so cool, even, even working through that process, to sit on an elder board and all of us go, okay, we're going to maintain our integrity, but understand what this means. We could lose the property. We could lose everything. Um, because we don't know how we're going to get this loan in three weeks. And, and yet, it was just so cool to sit there, and there was just no question saying, you know what, that, you, you can't compromise out of fear. You've you got to just lay it out and then let the chips fall. That's a, that's a bad expression, huh? That's like gambling, <laughs> which we as elders don't do. Um, no. <laughs> but it's this, whole, uh, it's this whole idea. Yeah, that's, what other expression is it? Let the chips fall where they may. You know, it's just this whole idea of, you know, you just, you, you got to just be honest. You got to just lay it out there and suffer the consequences, but you got to trust that, you know what, God's not going to bless us for being deceptive. Like, when has that ever happened? When has he ever blessed someone because they were deceptive? There are times when he blessed people in spite of their deception, but, uh, you know, it's always best to just say, you know what, here it is, let's just lay it out, and we lose it, we lose it, but at least we maintain our integrity. Um, and I want to talk about that a little bit tonight. Um, after we experienced that on Monday, I thought, you know, I, I feel like it's something that we all struggle with because there's times in life when we need to make decisions and we know it would be so easy just to stretch the truth a tiny bit. I mean, it's not even technically lying. You know, you can even say the right words and everything else. And, uh, and we're so tempted to do that because it seems like it would make life easier and it also seems like everyone's doing it, right? I mean, everyone lies. And so what's the big deal? And yet, like we talked about last week, just because everyone's doing it, just because it's popular, doesn't mean that God hates it less. In fact, it says in Proverbs 12, verse 22, it says, The Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in men who are truthful. Okay, the Lord detests. Remember we talked about how last week, no, not all sins are the same. All sins do condemn, but the Bible does not teach that all sins are the same. There are certain things that God seems to emphasize. Um, and we talked about immorality last week and the way he focuses on This week I want to talk about honesty because it says that the Lord hates this. He detests uh, lips that speak evil or deception. And he delights in men who are truthful. And as we talk about honesty, you know, I, I struggled with this because I, I'm putting together this message, right? I'm looking up all these verses on honesty, deception, on and on and on. And, and I thought to myself, okay, there are people in this room who lie so much. I mean, so much. Like, it just kind of comes out your mouth. You can't even control it. You just lie. And I, I was talking to a girl in my office a couple weeks ago, and I finally had to stop her. I go, you know what? Do you think you could, is it like, can you even tell the truth? Like, like, you know, because there's certain people, you get to a point, it's like, do you ever get concerned? I ask, do you ever get concerned about yourself like you're not even able to tell the truth? Because she had already been caught in multiple huge lies. And I go, let's look through these things. And do you ever get concerned that you've been lying so long, like it's such a pattern that if I were to ask you to look me in the eyes and tell me the truth right now, you're not even sure you could tell the truth because you've been so used to deceiving people and lying. You ever meet people like that? Where you just go, man, I don't know if he or she has the ability to tell the truth. And I thought, okay, so, so what am I going to do? I'm going to preach a sermon on lying. Is that really going to change anyone? I mean, because that's a major thing. If someone's had this pattern of deception, and there are many of you in this room that have held things, you know, in secret for so long, am I really going to give a sermon where you go, okay, here it is. Here's what I've really done. Here's who I really am. Because, man, you're protecting some serious things. There are some things you are so embarrassed of, and you've worked so hard to deceive people for years. I was thinking, man, uh, the last thing I want, because I can put together a sermon on, on lying. I don't, I'm not worried about that. And I knew I could put together a sermon where you walk out the room and go, wow, that was a good sermon on lying. But that's not the goal. It's where you go, ooh, that was a good sermon. You know, I mean, the goal is that we would come clean. Because here's the thing, okay, I've been there. I, 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 man, I was a liar my whole life, you know? 
just, just growing up. It's all my brother's fault. He, um, <laughs> oh, he was so good at lying. And I, he's my big brother, and he taught me. And uh, I remember, you know, he'd, he'd get bad grades, right? And he always would shoot for an F because uh, the F you can change to a B. And he was saying the D's and C's you really can't change. He goes, if I get an F, it's, it's an automatic B. I just, you know, add a couple of squiggles. And, and I thought, wow, that's so cool. And, uh, but, but I remember, this, this is how good he was, or how bad he was. Kids, don't be like him. He, uh, when we were juniors, when he was a junior in high school, he asked my mom if he could buy a car. And my mom said no. And he bought one anyways and parked it around the corner. And every day we'd go, yeah, we're walking to school. And we'd walk around the corner and get in his car and, uh, and drive to school. And we did this for a year. A year. I thought, wow, we had a car for a year. She didn't know. And it was cool because on rainy days, she would let us take the family car to school. And so we'd drive around the corner and my brother would jump in his car and let me drive the family car. <laughs> I was like 13, 14 years old. I mean, this is this. So this is the way I grew up. It was like, yeah, I was the coolest freshman, man. You know, I got to school, take all my friends to lunch, everything. And uh, and I remember this one time, though. I totally remember. Like we went to school, you know, in his car, and then midway through the day, it started raining. And so we're driving home, and my mom was coming to the school to pick us up because it was raining. And so we're driving this way, and she's coming right at us. And I go, Paul, it's mom. And he goes, Duck. <laughs> Oh, I still remember that. We're just down for a few seconds. I go, I think she's passed. I think she's passed. And, you know, and then he drives around. We go back to the school parking lot and start walking in the rain. and go, oh, hey, Mom. You know, I mean, that's, so it was just this deception, right? And, and it was just lie after lie after lie. And, oh, man, I got to go on and on about my, my deceptive lifestyle you know, and, and, and I was thinking, you know, many of us grow up, it's weird how lying just comes so naturally, right? I mean, you, as a little kid, you know, you've seen your little kid's holding a marker, right? And there's drawings all around the wall and going, I didn't do it, I didn't do it, you know? And, and it's just the first thing out of their mouth is just this lie. And I was thinking, okay, what, what changed? I mean, at what point did it, did it just, flip? it wasn't a sermon, no one ever preached a sermon on honesty that actually made me change. And so it's kind of frustrating because I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm going, man, there's going to be people in there that have been lying for years and years and years. What was it that changes a person? What, what gets them from this path of deception to, to then go, you know what, I, I'm going I'm to pursue the truth, pursue the truth. And I'm not saying that I never lie. Uh, you know, we, you know but, but it's like you first, you get rid of these big lies, Right? And then you realize, ah, oh, there's still some more deception in there. Ah, oh, there's still some deception. Ah, oh, but every time you just get cleaner and cleaner and cleaner, and 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 still, all throughout your life, it seems like there's still a little bit of deception, a little bit of deception, but less and less and less until the Bible says we get to this point of maturity and completeness. But what puts a person on that road? And I and I felt pretty helpless because I thought a sermon's not going to pull it off tonight by any stretch of the imagination. And so, honestly, I didn't study a ton this week. Because Paul says uh, in 1 Corinthians, he says, um, he talked about how he didn't come to the Corinthians with eloquence or superior wisdom, but he came with a demonstration of power. And I was looking at that passage, and I'm thinking, man, when Paul went to a place, he just spoke with power. It wasn't a carefully crafted sermon. He just came powerfully with a demonstration of the Spirit. And so every time I was going to study, I just said, you know, I'm going to pray instead this week. I'm just going to pray that God does something. That it's just something supernatural, something I can't explain, just a power that gets you to change and sets you on that road. Because no one can talk someone else into truth. And I, you know, I was speaking at this uh, conference for pastors last week, and I, and I was telling them, I go, you know, sometimes I feel like our church services, in our church services, we can sound more like the prophets of Baal than like Elijah. 
Remember a story in First Kings 19, with uh, 18 or 19, where, where it talks about how there were the prophets of Baal, and, and Elijah challenges them. They're on Mount Carmel, and they have this sacrifice on this on this on this to- top of this mountain, and they go, you know what? Why don't you guys get your God to? Uh, why don't you get Baal to light that thing on fire? And so the prophets of Baal they start jumping up and down, hundreds of them screaming, cutting each other, <laughs> you know, just working themselves into a frenzy. And nothing really happened, but they had a good time. You know, they're screaming, they're shouting. Then afterwards, Elijah just prays quietly and just says, God, do your thing. And then fire comes out of heaven and consumes that sacrifice. And everyone is just left going, no way. That was awesome. And I I just question these pastors. I go, what do our services feel like? Don't you feel like a lot of times we can just jump up and down and, you know, and, and, and enjoy each other's company? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But did anything happen that was supernatural? Did God act? Did fire really come down into this room? And I just started praying for that. I just started praying, saying, God, you know, I can't, I can't make anyone stop lying. Would you do something Supernatural. And I was thinking about this idea of deception. Do you realize that there's only one time in the New Testament when God strikes someone dead? He did it all the time in the Old Testament. But New Testament, and it's a shorter span in the New Testament, you know, it's just, it's just a few years, you know, whereas the Old Testament spans over thousands of years. The New Testament, we're just talking about, you know, 80, 80, 90 years, something like that. And there's only one instance when he struck someone dead. And that was in the early church in Acts chapter 5 with Ananias and Sapphira. And if you remember the story, Ananias and Sapphira, they were a couple that, that sold some property and gave it to the church, gave the money to the church, but they held back some of it. And they lied about it, which, which was dumb because from what we understand in the passage, they didn't even have to give the money. But there was just some sort of proud, it was like this, it was really a white lie, if anything, because they're going, you know what, here's all the money. I mean, it was a good thing that they did. They sold their land and gave the money to the church. It's just when Peter says, is that all of it? They go, yeah, yeah, it was all of it. And they really held back some. And it says in Acts chapter 5, the story says in verse 3, it says, Then Peter said to Ananias, so he says to the man, because he came alone, he says, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Then the next verse, Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? So I say, see, he says, look, didn't, didn't the land belong to you? And after you sold it, you could have done whatever you wanted with the money. Just be honest with it. So then he says, what made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. And then in verse 5, it says, when Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Uh, to me, I go, man, that's an understatement. Great fear seized the church. I mean, can you imagine? And then right after that happened, his wife comes in, and they ask her, hey, did you give us all of the money? And she says, yes. And Peter says, you know what? The same people that just carried out your husband, they're going to carry you out also. And she falls over and dies. Okay, I'm reading this, and I'm going, see, God, that would work. Okay, you know? I mean, can you imagine? I mean, it says great fear sees the church. And I'm going, man, are you kidding me? Of course it did. And I look at a passage like that, and I think, wow, could you imagine? Could you imagine if something like that happened? If I, if I, if I, asked, uh, if I asked Phil something over there, I go, hey, man, just tell me the truth right now. And he lied to me, and I knew it. And I said, Phil, you're stretching the truth. And he just fell over. I mean, right now. And then Paula tries to defend him, goes, no, really, really. And she falls over too. I mean, can you imagine how that, you process that for a week, you come back next week and I ask someone else a question. Can you imagine what you would think inside? Like, 
okay, let me think, 100% truth, 100% truth. I saw what happened to those last two. You know, I just think, okay, that's the power of God, right? Now, the truth is, is, is there are times when God makes us tell the truth, right? Where he exposes us. There are times like with David where he sends a prophet and just says, look, you're lying when Nathan came to him. But isn't it so much better when nothing external happens like that and instead of being exposed, you confess? To me, that's one of the most beautiful things that can happen. I I love that. I love that. Don't you love it? When someone wasn't caught but instead they just come out and say, here's the truth about me. I'm praying for that. In fact, I I want you to pray about that. Would would you just bow your heads right now? I just want to give God some, some room, some time. In fact, right now, would you just pray to God and ask him, ask him to do something supernatural in this room, in everyone's heart, that he would convict everyone in this room of the lies in their life. Just just pray for everyone right now. God, would you cleanse our businesses of slight deception? And trust, help us to trust that, you know what, it's just always best to be absolutely honest. Help us to trust that, really believe that. Father, would you cleanse our families of deception, husbands and wives that are holding things from each other, parents and kids, that are guilty, which is deceiving each other. And God, just all of our friendships that are based upon lies, Father, may you just cleanse us of those things. Help us to trust that coming clean is going to just make everything so much better because you are God. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to. Um, I just want to share one last passage with you that, uh, that that hit me the most when I was looking at these passages, and it's in Proverbs chapter thirty. Proverbs chapter thirty, starting in verse seven, he says this. Okay, look at this phrase, and then think about how you would complete this sentence, because he says this in Proverbs thirty, verse seven: Two things I ask of you, Lord. Or I ask of you, O Lord, do not refuse me before I die. Okay, if you had to complete that, if you were writing this proverb and you said, okay, God, here's two things I want before I die. Please, just these two things. I'm not being greedy. I just want these two things before I die. How would you complete that? Now look what this, what this guy says. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Isn't that crazy? Okay, these are the two things he's saying, God, just, if I could have anything, these two things, don't deny me, these two things. And the first thing he says is, keep falsehood and lies far from me. He goes, if there's one thing I could have, I want to be an honest person. So just keep the lie. I mean, that's his greatest prayer. It shows you something about his heart. Here we are reading in the wisdom literature. These are, these are from the wisest people who have ever lived. This is from Agur. He says, you know what? Just keep these falsehood and lies for I just want to be truthful. I want to be a truthful person. That's so important to me. So keep falsehood and lies far from me. But then the other thing he prays for, he goes, and, and the other thing is, give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. And I thought about that prayer, and I thought, would any American pray that? God, okay, one thing I ask is don't let me get rich. I don't want to have, like, enough for the rest of my life. 
Just, just give me only my daily bread. He goes, don't have me starve to death. He goes, but here's my request, God. I just want my daily bread. I just wanna, I want to live paycheck to paycheck. That's his prayer. And he explains it after. He goes, otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. Isn't that an interesting prayer? He says, See, God, if you, have, if you give me too much, and we've seen that in Scripture, those who have too much, they forget God. And that's why he says it's so hard for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. This guy goes, man, make sure, God, just don't deny me this. Promise me you won't give me too much. When's the last time you prayed that? Think about that. Because God, promise me you're not going to make me rich. This is just like one of two requests that you got to give me before I die is don't let me get rich. I, I, just, I don't want to be a liar, and I don't want to be rich, and I don't want to be poor. He goes, just give me my daily bread. See, he says, I actually want to be in a place of dependence. See, God, the one thing in my life is I don't want to forget about you. And if I have too much, then I don't need to depend on you anymore. And yet that's the American dream, is to set ourselves up in such a way that we don't have to depend on God. I've got plenty. Most of us really didn't need him this week to provide for us. We're fine. And this guy goes, no, I want to be in a place of dependence. And so please don't give me too much. And I said, I wonder if we could really pray that. With our culture and our mindset and the way we have been trained, this is so ingrained in our heads, that could we actually pray to be dependent people who have only their daily bread? Can we really pray the Lord's Prayer and mean it and say, God, I actually like that. I actually want to be a person that every day I pray, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. Because none of us, I don't think any of us have ever prayed that and really meant it. Right? We pray it, we say it, but in the back of our minds, it's like, man, I could eat bread for 20 years, you know? I, I got plenty. And there's something about that dependence, and I just started praying that this week. And go, God, I, I want to I be wise enough like this person. I want to be wise enough to realize that I actually don't want too much because too much would keep me from being dependent on you, and I might just forget all about you. But Lord, I do want to pray. I, I do want to live paycheck to paycheck. I do want to give away the access because then I have to experience you every week. You know, it was interesting because a, a few months ago, probably three months ago, was my guess. I'm not trying to be dishonest. I'm just trying to think. Three weeks, three months ago, around, I um, I prayed and I thought, God, you know, I think my life is a little bit too easy. Like everything's kind of coming together and I'm getting a little casual about you. You ever, you ever get that way? Where things are just cruising and they're fine. It's actually a good stage of life and I feel like all the challenges I'm meeting head on and just everything's going fine. And it, it had been going like that for a while. And I just said, God, you know, this isn't that great. <laughs> and I, I said, you know, I, I think I need some adversity in my life I think you need to make some things more difficult to get me more passionate in prayer. So he answered my prayer. <laughs> and, and it was so cool because this week, you know, I'm on my knees just coming before God and saying, God, okay, now I can't do it. Now it's, this is impossible. The things I believe you want me to do and the challenges that are in my face right now I, I don't see any way I can humanly pull this off. I'm not seeing light at the end of the tunnel. You have to fix certain things for me. You have to do this. You, and I just started naming things that were out of my control. And it was as I was praying, I realized, wait, this is what I prayed for. This type of urgency where, God, you must come through, you must come through, you must come through. It's what I wanted. And I don't lift that up and say, yeah, that's the way I always pray. I'm just going, man, you know, it's, it's at certain points in your life, God gives you wisdom to realize that comfort isn't all it's cracked up to be. And it can create a laziness. And if God is truly our number one desire, then we would pray, you know what, Lord, put me in situations where I'm dependent on you and I need you. In fact, don't make things too easy. 
don't give me too much because I could forget you. And I know right now a lot of us are hurting financially. Um, some of you guys are in some pretty difficult situations, you know, with housing. I mean, I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands. Hey, how many lost their house? You know, it's just, it's nuts. How many have lost their jobs, lost their houses, taken pay cuts, everything else? And it's a crazy time. I mean, we're not, we're not desperate in the sense that, you know, like people are around the world, but it's very real to us. And I'm just saying, you know what, don't take it all as a curse. Don't take it all as, God, what went wrong? Because there's something good about dependence. In fact, this, this writer of Proverbs in Proverbs 30 was wise enough to even ask for that in his life. And I just encourage you to think through because a lot of times in church we can say very grand statements like, ah, oh, your love is greater than life. I'm going, really? Do you really mean that? So then you're willing to give up some of these things if that will bring you closer to his love because his love is that great? Do you long for it? Do you desire it? See, I, all, all I want today is I want to free you from guilt. I want to free you from deception. I, 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 I lied after becoming a Christian. There were some big lies in my life. And I still remember those days when I was hiding so much. It was the worst feeling. And we've all done it. We've all hidden stuff. Even after becoming believers, we hide things. You know that sick feeling you get? And the bigger the, the, the lie is, the harder it is to live with yourself, the harder it is to sleep. Like, like David says it perfectly. He says, I felt like the inside of me was wasting away, like my bones were literally rotting away, like I could feel this pressure, this heaviness in me. I, I remember times when people would, would look at me in the eyes and say, hey, I need to talk to you about something. And immediately my heart would just start pounding through my chest because I thought, oh no, do they know? And it'd be nothing, right? You know, and they go, oh, yeah, 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 I wanted to ask you about what kind of tires you have in your car. And you're just like, oh, good. Because you just had that guilty, man, I hope they don't know, I hope they don't know, I hope they don't know. And then once it's found out and it's released and it's out there, like David said, it's like, oh, I could breathe again. You know, that's all I want. Because I think some of you are, are miserable. You come to church and... The moment I talk about deception, you start feeling that stuff in your chest and you get nervous. What if I walk out of this room and someone asks me what I'm lying about? You don't want to be asked that. And I'm just saying, man, that's just such a terrible way to live. It's so good to be free from that. It's so good to confess rather than to be exposed. And so that's my prayer today. That's my desire. My desire is not that we walk away feeling guilty, feeling shame. My desire is that we walk away so much more in love with the cross because we realize, man, that's why Jesus died. Jesus died for whatever I'm hiding. Jesus died for this sin that I've been suppressing. And yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to confess to some people, but you know what? I can be forgiven of that if I confess. And that's my desire. I'm going to have uh, the worship team come back out, and we're just going to close with one last song. But here's what I, I want to do is I, I want to give you some space before we sing. Again, if you would just bow your heads. Yeah, I, I don't want to try to manipulate anything because I have no clue what's going on in your lives. I just know that I can honestly say I prayed for this weekend a lot more than I normally do. Because I wanted fire to come down from heaven in a different way. I want to be a God thing where you are struck with some of the stuff that's, that you've been hiding. And this would be the night you come clean. There'll be people up by the prayer room if you need to pray with someone. But I just want you to spend some time alone with God who knows the truth about everything and just talk through these things with him. 
tell him the biggest lies in your life right now. And you may not even sing through this whole song. It just may be a whole confession time. You may need prayer with someone. You may want to get baptized and just be cleansed of everything and start over. You may go, you know what, I don't even know if I'm going to heaven. 